Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar in the Startups and ESCCP webinar series. My name is Rula Deep. I'm a principal at Geosyntec Consultants in Oakland, California, and the organizer of the webinar series on behalf of Startups and ESCCP. I will be facilitating today's call. The webinar will consist of a brief overview of Startup and ESCCP by Dr. Robin Nissan followed by an overview of a few of our upcoming webinars in this series. Following Robin's opening remarks, we will transition to the technical portion of the webinar. Today's webinar will feature two speakers who will discuss ways to understand and mitigate the risks associated with lead-free electronics. First, Dr. Peter Borgeson will share results from a third project on microstructurally adapted constitutive relationships and reliability assessment protocols for lead-free soldier. He will be followed by a short Q&A session. Then Dr. Stephen Master will discuss results of his project on whisker mitigating composite conformal cost assessment. Following a short Q&A session, uh, we will conclude the webinar with a longer Q&A session that will include both of our speakers. Just as a quick reminder, today's broadcast will be listen only. You may submit questions by using the chat box, which is located in the left-hand portion of your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we do encourage you to submit questions in advance of the Q&A session. With over 110 attendees on today's call, it is logistically challenging to open all the lines for oral questions. Therefore, the phone lines will remain listen only throughout this presentation. Uh, with that, I would like to turn this over to uh, Dr. Robin Nissan, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, the um, uh, sort of an ESCCP uh, program as well as um, uh, his program area. Uh, Dr. Nissan is a sort of an ESCCP program manager for weapons systems and platforms. Before joining sort of an ESCCP, Robin was with Nevers Weapons Division China Lake in California. And with that, I turn it over to you, Robin. Uh, thank you very much, Rula, and good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Um, let's see, I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about CERDIP and ESTCP, who we are and what we do. Uh, CERDIP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program. It was established by Congress in 1991 and it was a partnership between DOD, DOE, and EPA. Uh, CERDIP is requirements driven. Uh, which means we try to um, identify high priority environmental science and technology opportunities that address DOD requirements. Uh, we do both advanced technology development as well as fundamental research to impact real world environmental problems. Okay. Um, the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program. Um, is there to demonstrate innovative and cost-effective environmental and energy technologies. Uh, we capitalize on past investments and try to transition technologies out of the laboratory into the real world. And uh, to do that, we try to facilitate regulatory acceptance. Okay, so... And I'm... Okay, here we go. So, um, uh, nope, this first. Okay. So here are the here are the areas of uh, of um, that we work in. We work in energy and water, environmental restorations, uh, munitions response, resource conservation and climate change, as well as weapon systems and platforms. Uh, today's discussion is, is in the area of weapon systems and platforms, and here we go. So wrong one. Ah, okay, so we have uh, several focus areas in weapon systems and platforms, surface engineering, uh, structural materials, energetic materials, uh, noise and emissions, uh, wastewater, re waste reduction and treatment, uh, and finally uh, this area, lead-free electronics. And uh, 
lead free is is an area that's been with us for a while. Um, we're very used to how how electronics work in the leaded arena. What we're not as familiar with is what happens when you have to take lead out, which is where we're heading right now. And uh, whiskers isn't the only problem, and you'll hear more about that from our first speaker. So at this point, here we go. Um, I want to talk just, a, just very briefly about uh, some of the upcoming webinars. And you'll see about every two weeks we have a, uh, a, a new area that's going to be um, on the agenda. And uh, you can go to our CERTIP and ESTCP website uh, to see our webinar series and to look out into the future and see what's available. With that, I'm going to pass it back to Rula, who's going to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Robin. And uh, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Peter Borgeson. Uh, Peter is a professor of System Science and Industrial Engineering at Binghamton University, uh, since, and he's been there since 2009. For the past decade, Peter has focused a major part of his research on the reliability of microelectronics assembled with lead-free soldier joints. Peter earned a PhD in physics from Denmark. He worked at the Riso National Laboratory in Denmark and at the Max Black Institute for Plasma Physics in Germany, and then spent eight years in the materials science department at Cornell and 15 years in industry running multi-million dollar consortium sponsored research program on electronics manufacturing. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Peter. Thank you so much for giving uh, this presentation. Thank you, Runa. Uh, yeah, uh, what I'm going to address, and you can look at that long uh, title, but what I'm going to talk about is uh, how to assess the reliability of lead free solid joints. And so my agenda, first I'm going to just give you a little bit of the motivation for why this is a big deal. Uh, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the challenges you're up against in, in doing this. Uh, and how we approach the whole thing. And uh, then I'm going to just briefly indicate to you the, the results. Uh, we have effectively uh, two types of results. Uh, we provide what's called constitutive relations. I'll explain that. And then protocols and recommendations uh, based on the results. Uh, and uh, I've got to talk briefly about what the benefits of this stuff is and some conclusions. So. First, the problem. Uh, the electronics is everywhere, as we know. It's a major uh, part of, of every part of the world today. But I mean, also the volumes of electronics are mind-boggling out there. And uh, that inc therefore, there is an enormous amount of electronic waste. And in fact, uh, this is waste that is not as commonly disposed of as, as a lot of other waste. Uh, it is not uh, biodegradable or anything like that in any, in any level. And it has a, a large amount of toxic uh, elements in it, uh, notably lead, which has been known to be a hazard since the Roman times. In fact, uh, I'm told that, that, that some historians believe that that was the fall of the Roman Empire, was uh, people uh, being basically subjected to, uh, to lead poisoning from the uh, water pipes. Uh, certainly, it's been mentioned here. Uh, and Steph, who's going to talk next, has wanted to drop this one out that is mentioned in the Old Testament. But there's an overall understanding environmentally that we need to get uh, let out uh, of the environment and get it away from, from the landfills and, and the rivers and wherever it goes after that. Uh, so when we go to electronics, uh, where is lead used? Well, it's used less now. We'll talk about that. But it is used. Uh, everywhere in the in the electronics assembly, more than anything else, is used in solder, and that so electronics um, in uh, manufacturing is um, very heavily uh, uh, reliant on uh, soldering. Uh, that's what effectively makes electronics uh, as high performing and as cost effective as it is today, is the use of solder. 
And so it's used at different levels where you uh, from attaching chips to components to uh, attaching the components to printed circuit boards. Its uh, components uh, come protected with solder, it was called pre tinning. Uh, in, you know, at all levels of putting electronics together, is, is, a solder is used a lot. And uh, traditionally, that, was, that solder was uh, leaded solder, uh, a combination of tin and lead with about 37% lead in it. Now, uh, the electronics manufacturing, as I said, relies heavily on that. And it uh, uh, there's a lot of experience with it. Solder has been around since the uh, since again the Roman times. Uh, so there's a lot of experience. Uh, with, first of all, with how solder electron solder behaves, and there was also a reason for for selecting it, which is it behaves very well, compared to anything else. Its behavior is quite simple and and understandable, reproducible. And so uh, the understanding may not have been as perfect as we think, but if, from an engineering perspective, we had it under control uh, with, with experience and calibration to experience and so on. But that was, has been forced out uh, some years ago. Uh, the, big, uh, the big year we refer to mostly 2006, where the Europeans uh, started banning, heavily started banning lead, and of course it's been phased out in stages in commercial and other electronics. Uh, and uh, there has been a lot of a lot of uh, learning needed for that for the industry, but that learning really doesn't carry over that well to the military sector because the requirements both on service conditions and service life are very different in most of the commercial sectors. Uh, now that brings us to that uh, if that really two things that limit the life of electronic components. One is if uh, you build substandard stuff, you build uh, def uh, defective assemblies. And otherwise, it's uh, you, very common in the long-term service life of your electronics is limited by fatigue. Now, fatigue is when you apply a cyclic load. You either load it and unload it, or you load it and then you load it in the opposite direction. So fatigue occurs for example, in vibration, where your whole uh, printed circuit board is vibrating and as you're bending up and down, and you're pushing, uh, therefore, the, the solder joints and the connections are being uh, stressed in one direction or another. Or it happens in what we call thermocycling, where temperatures uh, change, and when temperatures change, uh, things expand, printed circuit boards expand, chips expand, and so on, but they don't expand the same. And so there's the stresses between them uh, because they're stuck together. And so you get uh, uh, cyclic stresses. And uh, what we're looking to and what we're particularly addressing is to how to assess, how to understand and assess and judge the reliability of uh, liquid solder in cycling. And uh, that is a fundamental for uh, you to decide to go into this. And it's fundamental for trying to optimize, even if you are deciding on uh, a particular, that a particular product can be built, you're very commonly at least working on trying to make the best possible reliability out of it. So there are two requirements normally for assessment of reliability, two different uh, customers for this. They're the people who want to know if this particular product will last 25 years in service. And then there's the people who are saying, well, you know, we've got to go with this, but let's do the best we can. And that's actually more common in, in most of the, mostly in the industry is uh, to say it's already been design, decided we're going to go with this product, but I'm going to optimize the design, I'm going to optimize my materials, and so on. In both cases, I need to test and I need to uh, judgment of reliability. And I do that in accelerated testing. I apply some sort of load and, and hold it for time or not, and I unload again. And then I count how many times can I do that until it fails. And that could be a test where I go vibrate something for four hours. And based on that, I say, hey, you know, in will use, of course, we wouldn't be so brutal. We would do it much milder. And so it would correspond to 10 years of regular realistic vibration. So what we have here is an acceleration of failure. And what we define as an acceleration factor to tell, uh, help us decide on, on life. So 
Uh, the concern is that the predictions we make cannot be directly verified experimentally. We can't generally wait and test for 15 years to know that our 15-year prediction was okay. Uh, so we need some sort of faith in it, and really the only uh, credible way is to understand the underlying mechanisms for why things fail. The concerns we're up against first, of course, is, is the damage mechanism the same that we actually do in our test and we do in use? But otherwise, what is the acceleration factor? That is, you know, how do I relate a certain amount of test in my time to test in service? And even if I don't know that, uh, very commonly at least, is the, uh, are the acceleration factors the same? That is, if I'm comparing two different things, uh, two different designs, two different uh, materials, whatever, uh, the one that does better in my test, is that also the one that's going to do better in service? That would be the easiest. If it's not, can I use my test at least to say which one will do better in use? I'm going to show you an example here. What we really have is a set uh, is a test, it's a thermocycling test in this case, where we looked at four different uh, alternative designs of a component. And uh, we then cycled them to encounter the number of cycles to failure. And based on that, if you look at that, you would say components or designs C and D clearly do better than A and B. So this would be my normal choice of, um, of design. And I'll go and make sure that, that the test failure mechanism is indeed what uh, I would expect in service. And then I say, okay, I'm going to go with C or D. But if we did another thermal cycling test, this one a considerably milder test, we didn't vary the temperatures as much, but it's still a realistic accelerated test, and I did the same components here or the same uh, designs, what you suddenly see is actually design A is much better than the other one. So now what do I do? Well, the simple thing is to say the milder thing is, is closer to what real life loading is going to be. But it's still pretty far from it. So if I don't understand what's going on here, I really don't know much what to do with my test results. This is a part of the stuff that we have been, uh, been addressing in our work. So what we're up against in general is we, 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 in the industry every day does massive amount of testing, comes up with these test results of accelerated tests. And we're here to try to help them extrapolate these results to different conditions or to interpret the test results. Simply, what, is, what do my test results tell me? And the standard approach of the industry really is to at, associate a model with that. And we're going to do the same thing. We've got to say, OK, this is what, what was done every day, uh, is you, you go and calculate now what happened in your test in terms of what were the stresses and the strains as a function of time and temperature. And then uh, you say, what would have been instead the stresses and the strains in, in uh, use conditions I'm interested in? And uh, what I need then, based on those stresses and strains, I'm going to then predict the damage. And what I need for that, when I'm going to do that, is what we call constitutive relations. This is expressions that tell me what is, what is the creep, the plastic deformation as a function of temperature, stress, time, and so on. And that means I need to know something about the properties of the solder in this case. The other thing I need to know is if I knew this stuff, you know, if I knew the stress and the temperature and so on, what would be the damage done at, uh, at the given time by that stress? And again, that's another aspect of solder properties. And that's what we always done and did with singlet solder. And the problem we're up against now is that for lead free, uh, the, tin, the, the, the properties of the solder are not stable. They weren't totally stable for tin lead, but it was not, not a serious or, or critical problem. But for lead free solder, that's a big deal. So what we're up against is, and we the research to support that, is that we have um, that the properties of the material are determined. They're actually determined by two different aspects of the uh, of the uh, tin uh, uh, of the tin uh, material. That is the basis of the solder here. Okay, this is a, a 97 percent or so is tin, and then there's some some uh, part part of some precipitates in them. There's two aspects to it. One is that the properties actually depend 
on um, the uh, orientations of the tin grains, but that's a randomizing factor. So that simply gives you some uh, variability to your results, and you can look at averages or the worst case or whatever. But the other thing that is really the more uh, disturbing thing is is that, that that something is changing as we go in the solder. And that's something we're not used to from modeling, so we have to count on that the properties of the material is not the same in the first cycle as it is in the next one and the next one and so on. Or it's not the same after a few weeks of sitting around and things like that. And that's just determined by the fact that, that really the solder joint is a precipitate hardened material. So it has what you can see here on the top of these two uh, images here. It has these colonies of precipitates. Uh, in the tin, and these precipitates really determine and dominate the deformation properties. Uh, and so what we, we need to do is we need to predict how they are, they are distributed and how these distributions change. And then we're going to predict the, how the damage evolves with the stress and temperature, and again with the distributions of these precipitates. So the, as a first deliverable, as one deliverable out of this, we, uh, we looked at and, and, and how we could express the deformation properties, the creep rates. Remember, we need the creep rates to model. And so how we can express the creep rates as a function of these uh, precipitate distributions. And we showed that they can be um, expressed simply as uh, in terms of the spacing between the average spacing between the precipitates, as well as a whole bunch of parameters that we went and measured, you know, the constants and the temperature dependencies and so on, all properties, but including a factor in there that's uh, denoted as lambda. And this lambda factor uh, is the, the function of the precipitate spacing, which changes. So. Uh, Aside from these constants that we're giving you, um, and that's put sort of pretty standard approach, and that is, uh, we need to calculate um, the precipitate spacing. Now, the precipitate spacing is originally determined by how we form the solder joints. In realistic manufacturing, you go, where you solder anything, you go melt the solder. Uh, put it in contact with the metal uh, contact pads that you want to bond to, and then you cool down the solder so it solidifies, and you have a solder joint. And you do the same thing in manufacturing, and realistically what happens is that there is a variability in that, in that process. And that's a, a fundamental variability, nothing you can do about it really, uh, that is, it, it has to do with the difficulty of solidification. It may not, it's not something you normally notice if you're not into it, but in fact, the solder does not solidify when you hit the melting point, like in, when you're cooling down. And so you end up cooling it significantly below that before it solidifies. But anyway, that determines, that solidification determines the distributions of the precipitates and in, initially. Okay? And so uh, for one thing, uh, we need, you need to know the, the initial uh, distribution, and uh, you either go measure that in your own samples, which is not a practical thing for most uh, practitioners, or you predict it based on uh, expressions that we're, we're giving you. And then um, and the, the thing that gives that as your issue is uh, you can't, we can't just give you one number because it varies with things. It varies with the size of the joint, with pad finishes, with alloys and processes. But more importantly, as you can see there also, we took a, a particular case here of a material and we heated it for a while, uh, not very high temperature, but for a while, and these precipitate distributions changed enormously. Okay, so that, that is part of that lack of stability. And uh, the other thing that happens aside from heating it is if you do cycling, you're putting stresses on and temperature. And in that case, uh, you're also making, changing the precipitate distributions, and they're changing differently in different parts of your joint because the stresses are different there. And so what we have provided with you with then is a carefully researched and, and, and developed expression now where we're uh, coming up with an expression, effective expression for the 
change in precipitate this spacing as a function of temperature and time and cycling and everything. So it becomes this long expression and it looks perhaps daunting, but it's all numbers. You just you can put in for functions and expressions. You can put it in a spreadsheet. In fact, we provide a spreadsheet if you want, where you can just sit and calculate at any given time what will be the precipitate spacing as a function of time. Okay, so that's the ne one the next part of our deliverables in this. And then uh, we pretty much have now what well, we said, the um, expressions for uh, the deformation properties and the, the, and the materials properties. And what we need now is to say what happens in terms of damage. And when we talk about damage, uh, we have to look at how damage happens in uh, the lead free solders. And if you look at the to the top right here, you see a cross section of a typical solder joint. And in different colors, or slightly different colors, you can see basically different orientations of the tin grains. So you can see there's like three large tin grains in this joint. And uh, they're sort of special, but I'm not going to get into that. But the point is we've got very large grains. And the boundaries are there are actually not, not weak or anything like that. So this, if you were just going to go and vibrate or, or shear this, it would crack through the grains, not along any boundaries. But in thermal cycling, what happens is uh, that a lot of changes happen. Your precipitates change. And then the grains turn into fine grains and we crystallize into this polycrystalline picture you see towards the bottom left there. And then uh, the, the uh, joint cracks along that. We first go and check. The same thing happens in pretty mild conditions, like just temperature variation from room temperature up to 60 degrees centigrade. So that is, we're actually testing something that's likely to happen in service on use. And based on that, again, we can provide you with what we need for modeling. That is a rate of damage per thermal cycle that expresses it in terms of parameters that can, again, be measured or predicted or calculated. Uh, the temperature, and it's specifically the maximum temperature in your cycle, the time of, of, that you add that temperature, uh, constants that we're providing you with, and then the work done uh, during the high temperature as well, which I said can be calculated because we can calculate stresses and strains and so on. So if that is the entire uh, constitutive relations for anybody who wants to predict life in uh, thermal cycling. Now, in vibration or anything else in where the temperature is constant, uh, the situation is different. In that case, we don't get the recrystallization that you saw. Uh, and what you get instead is cracking just through the grains. And in that case, the damage function is a lot simpler. Even if it's after some aging and the precipitates have changed and so on, the properties are different. But you just will calculate the work in the cycle. A complication arises if you look here. Really, what happens in real life is not does not look like a mild uh, accelerated test or anything like that. It, it it actually gives you you know your airplane takes off, you get hard, strong vibration during takeoff and mild vibration while it's flying and things like that. You get a lot of variations in the loading uh, amplitudes here, and that that complicates matters because. In that case, the constitutive relations, the deformation properties keep varying depending on the specifics of that loading history. So your properties afterwards are different because it saw some high cycles or not. And so there's a lot more work that needs to be done to predict this in the usual fashion. And what we did instead is we sort of revolutionized the way you look at this to develop a, a what is a semi-empirical model uh, for now that works and to predict, you can do this kind of random vibration you see there uh, based on simple accelerated tests with uh, fixed amplitude cycling. We provide a series of test protocols uh, where we're recommending uh, conditions that should do aging uh, before cycling. Uh, we uh, we make recommendations about vibration uh, uh, and testing and how that ought to be done. 
we provide uh, recommendations about how your thermal cycling tests should look, and we uh, provide specifically recommendations, which has not been done before by anyone, uh, to how do you test for the real world scenario where it isn't even as clean as this. I said, hey, you know, amplitudes in cycling aren't constant, but the other thing is life isn't either thermal vibration or so thermal cycling or vibration or whatever, it's very often a mixture of things. Yes, you have some temperature variations and then wear out, but then also you have some vibration in between. And how do you test for that? Depends on your conditions again, on what you're concerned for really, and what is the worst case that could happen. We define that. And finally, the military and aerospace community relies very much on, on environmental stress screening, which and requires you to sort of go and stress all your uh, assemblies to a, a certain amount, and you take a little bit of life out of the components, but the, all the defects are supposed to die there. And we pro provide recommendations to those protocols, and we are, have shown how current and common protocols can be, uh, are likely to be very often much, much more damaging than the people who designed the test thoughts. So we make recommendations as to that as well. So the benefits of our results is that we provide a mixture of an understanding on how to generalize your observations, what you're seeing, how to optimize things in terms of reliability, obviously. And if you don't have these things, uh, our argument is, you know, all that testing you're doing out there is at best useless, and at worst, it may actually be misleading, leading you to do the wrong things. We also provide you with tools or the input that's needed by the people who are doing the finite realm modeling, and we uh, provide you very importantly with a basis for making realistic comparisons to new alternatives out there. That is when people are starting to look at totally different alloys, or when people are starting to look at it, sintered silver or nano copper, et cetera, to, to replace high temperature solders. And if you don't have understandings like this, the comparisons there could be truly, uh, uh, truly mind-boggling, misleading. At the moment, there is a common tendency for people to just go test and the same accelerated test, the two alternatives like sintered silver and solder, and say, oh, the sintered silver it lasted longer on my test. But that's completely meaningless you have to understand what that means in terms of acceleration. So in conclusion, uh, the DOD is going to follow uh, the commercial sector. It is going to change the electronic interconnect material, uh, if at all possible. And I'm going to let Steph comment much more on what's holding you up and not holding you up there. But if if it, it is not going to be able to do this, at least not with comfort, if they don't understand the reliability and what, what testing means and how to deal with it, and more than anything, how to avoid uh, surprises. Uh, uh, we have established constitutive relations and, and protocols. Uh, there's more work needed on vibration, and there's more work definitely still needed on the protocols. So as next steps, uh, these constitutive relations can now either be used directly by subject matter experts in their modeling. That's what we promised when we set out to do. This is what the whole uh, effort was about. Somebody needs to develop cookbooks, guidelines, and further protocols, and to demonstrate the modeling. That goes beyond anything we promised to do. It can, this can be done by us, it can be done by others, but it ought to get done. It can be done in companies. Somebody needs to issue specific guidelines, develop those for fine element modeling uh, in general on these issues. Uh, obviously, we can always improve on the parameter values in the expressions. I suggest that there's a need for work like this on high temperature alloys and other things as well out there. Uh, and what things that could be done would include developing design rules for uh, representative examples uh, so that that uh, you know, you don't have to go always to model every new detailed uh, uh, SMD packages, uh, but to have a, a quote, typical packages and, and some design rules for that. And I think there is a lot of work needed to go to the very small dimensions, maybe even to stacking of chips in 3D assembly. So 
That concludes uh, what I have prepared here. I want to acknowledge my co-workers, my Professor Eric Cox in the physics department here at the university and Professor Dodder at uh, Washington State University. And uh, that sounded a bit rushed to me, but I hope you guys followed some of this. And I'm certainly happy to take questions. Thank you, Peter, for a fascinating uh, presentation. We actually have a lot of questions that have been submitted. And as a reminder for everyone, if you want to ask questions, please submit them via the chat uh, box in the lower left side of your screen. Um, with that, Peter, uh, the first question that was submitted has to do with whether their um, studies have demonstrated that lead infiltrates into potable water. Can you please address that? Uh, it certainly has. I mean, uh, from, uh, from uh, electronic waste disposal and so on, there are areas, mostly in Asia, where it's, it's really rampant, uh, where that is, that, that, so you would, if you drink the water there, it's, you, your life expectancy is really short. Uh, there's a lot of that, uh, there, and, and I probably Steph can give you more examples on that, but, uh, but there, there's a lot of that out there. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, what do you think is the greatest obstacle to DOD transitioning to life free soldier that is addressed by your work? The greatest obstacles, it, in my expectation and experience with industries, really are uh, surprises. Okay, and surprises come in two forms. Uh, the, the, you get what we call sporadic defects. That's when you did the same thing as you did yesterday, you think, but you get a different result. Suddenly something's bad. And, and the other thing is a lot that's that sometimes hard to, to distinguish. That is when you suddenly have unexpected trends and behaviors, like the example I gave where you said, hey, I tested, then I know which one lasts better. And you do another test, you say, well, actually, that one is, about, is, is the worst one instead, and so on. Uh, Surprises more than anything scares practitioners, it scares designers and managers away from lead free because uh, everything relies on being predictable. I think you could probably make the DOD transition in a lot of areas uh, if they felt that they could predict what was going to happen and not be surprised. So I think the surprises uh, are, 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 the, are the most important part, and I think. Uh, that is certainly something that we, we help with in terms of having organized these complex trends so that you shouldn't have surprises. Great, thank you. Uh, you mentioned that the objective of the accelerated test is to understand the underlying mechanism of failure. Due to the quantitative nature of this data, what is the importance of the test sample size? That is, can we rely on the results of a single unit? Well, you can rely on uh, you know you can rely on anything uh, to some degree. It just is you, it's very little, and I know people will frown upon this when I say so. But I mean, I, from totally different areas, I've been in when we go back and looking at effects of neutron sputtering, and you could not get more than one or two data points. You know more than if you didn't have it. But it, it is it, the the less data or the less sample size you have the more on an understanding you need as well of what are the limit, you know, what can, how can you bracket uh, what you learned. So yes, I, I would claim that one single data point on one assembly would make me know more than I knew, knew before. But uh, I cannot give you a nice good handbook thing for your general uh, practitioner out there on what to do with small sample sizes. All right, thank you. Um, with regards to the Department of Defense moving towards lead free um, in these intercon in interconnects, are you aware of whether any consideration is being made for flip chip interconnects in microcircuit components? Well, flip chip uh, certainly uh, there, there was. Uh, there have, there, and, and in fact, uh, even in the, in the commercial sector, there were initial uh, exemptions for small dimension joints in some cases there because uh, the industry argued successfully that they couldn't do it without <coughs> using actually, in many cases, high lead solder uh, for some applications there. For the uh, commercial sector, that those exemptions have gone away. Uh, for the military, of course, uh, 
the military is not bound so much by the legislation as by by uh, the not becoming separate from the commercial cent. I mean, the whole military relies on cards in in so many ways out there, and and has to. Uh, not just on buying components, but on, on, on education of people, training of their staff, ways of thinking, understanding of failures, everything. Uh, and so I, I think uh, they're going to have to look at it as well. It's going to be let free in that. And certainly when you go to, if you want to implement it all, uh, the 3D assemblies, the stacking of chips on top of each other, which provides enormous benefits in performance and, and and energy consumption and everything, you've got to have to look at it's all as that for you. Thank you so much. Um, grain, uh, grain changes due to crystallization have significant effects on failure mode. So what in your opinion are the, what elements are optimal to having a more resistant original joint? Well, there are you can have uh, more. You, well, you have two different ends of it. You can you can go to different materials and different alloys. Or you, within this technology right now, where we at, uh, uh, there's been a number of efforts, uh, and they, they they keep being published and proposed uh, to improve on these things. Uh, one thing that has been popular for a bit has been that you can, by manipulating uh, mostly processes, but also alloy get a different structure of, of the, uh, I mean, in, in basically an interlacing of the grain structures you're seeing there, you can get much better performance out of that. Uh, and what we did after a while was to sort of step back from the excitement of the material scientist and say, yes, but in real life, so what is your benefit? And the, uh, when you look at it, what they're doing is they're they can, in some cases, improve your chance of getting a good structure, but they can't guarantee it. So if the worst part in your assembly is probably still going to fail just as fast. It's the rest of it's going to last. Uh, if you have a complex, uh, large uh, set of assemblies, something, you know, the early failures are going to be similar, but it's in, your, in your accelerated test, you're going to be kidding yourself because most of your joints are better than it used to be. So that breaks it down to uh, a lot less choices. If you want, if you want more predictability, uh, which is, as, as I mentioned, Pat, but more important than getting good lifetimes is to get a reproducible, or predictable lifetimes. Uh, tin that had the advantage; it was sort of, uh, it was a um, mixture of tin and lead regions, and there was not nearly the same variability of the behavior. And that's a hard one to compete with here in in that free. Uh, I, attempts have been made, but I don't see anything realistic there. Thank you. Peter, what is your view on the ESS screening efficiency methodology proposed by the ML, MIL Handbook 344? I think the, that it has, I mean, it has some obvious benefits. I, I don't, I think, you, you, uh, some, I mean, to do it. Uh, I understand why we want to do it. It is the competition we have between uh, dealing with defects and dealing with the reliability of a non-defective part, right? And then here what we, you're having is you have some of your parts supposedly not having significant defects, and you want those to have a good projected lifetime. At the same time, you want to get rid of the defects. And so you're trying to sort of balance those off by doing a little bit of damage to everything and saying the, de the defects will die and the rest won't. And, and there was good thinking behind that, how that was developed. But certainly for let free solder in particular, uh, what has never been investigated is that doing a little bit of damage is a lot more damaging than you'd think. Uh, and and as it, gets it gets to be a longer discussion, but but if, if you want to get the details, but basically the idea in, 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 in that p procedure is I'm going to do some, go shake the thing, do some preconditioning here, and my defect is going to die, and then I'm going to check that by doing accelerated testing that I didn't do a lot of damage to a good part. But your access, accelerated testing is going to be misleading in that case, and that's what we've shown, that your, the damage you did in terms of service life is a lot greater than you think. And so... I think it's a dangerous, it's a necessary, probably is necessary procedure, but it's dangerous, and it could, the protocols could be definitely be improved. 
And we're making some initial put, uh, recommendations on that, but of course, as everything else, uh, you know, more more systematic day-to-day -day work is needed. Thank you. Um, actual service conditions appear to vary widely. So, why do we care about the accuracy of predictions? Uh, the sim the simple answer first, okay, uh, is to say that. Uh, the industry relies on massive everyday testing. The only reason for that testing, accelerated testing, is to, that we're saying it, it tells us something about how things are going to perform in servers. Okay? Maybe it tells us how long it's going to last, but if it doesn't tell us that, as I said, it tells us, oh, well, if this design is going to last longer than that design, or this, uh, uh, this particular part or design is going to last just as long as the last one, or whatever. And so there has to be a link uh, between, between test and service. And so that's the first requirement. Even if you're saying, I don't know how long it's going to last in service, I do want to know that the one that did better in my test is going to do better in service or whatever. And since I can't do that always, and, and I showed examples of that, um, the next thing you need to do is you do need to be able to make some accurate predictions. If they're all off by the same factor, it's okay. But, but, but some accurate predictions so I can say that although this alternative did better in my test, it would do worse in service or whatever. So that, <clears throat> the more accurate, the better you can make that. Uh, and certainly, uh, the other question is, is I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a common question indeed. How do I predict the specifics of service condition uh, behavior? Uh, I, I totally agree that, that from one to the other, that's going to vary enormously. Uh, you can and, and may want to simply define worst case scenario out of possible service conditions. I mean, that's not an uncommon thing to do, and predict that with some accuracy. Right? So uh, again, that at least uh, allows you to, um, to make, make what I think is a reasonably meaningful, uh, meaningful uh, life prediction is, well, I can't say what's going to do in service, but it can't get any worse than this because realistically, uh, conditions can't get any worse here. So I think for that again, a accuracy, and I'm not talking about a fact of two or three here in, in prediction. I'm talking about it. you can predict things within the right order of magnitude or whatever, right? It's it's not it's not a uh, if you go and predict 20 year life and it's only a month, then you've got a problem. Peter, you've done a beautiful job of answering the questions thus far. Before we transition to the next speaker. Can you retell us what is the most important thing we can learn from your research? Sure. Okay. What you can learn more than anything is how uh, to compare alternatives, so alternative designs, in terms of materials, whatever. Uh, you know, simple testing, as, as as I mentioned, is naive. It's almost certain to be misleading. The best in test is not the best in service, and so. Uh, in particular, if you want to compare, certainly uh, you want to compare new technologies as well. Uh, what what you, you learn from this is how complex it was to understand uh, this solder. And therefore, if you sit back and think about it, uh, how complex is it to, to look at, an, at a comparison of tin bed solder to lead free solder is not a simple test and saying this one does better in my testing. Imagine what happens if you're saying I'm going to compare it to not solder, but to sintered silver or nano copper based SMEs, whatever. You, you, that's the, perhaps the most important thing we can learn from this kind of research. As I said, how do I compare alternatives? Thank you so much, Peter. We still have a few questions that we haven't gotten to, so we'll save them towards the end. And we're going to start with our next speaker, uh, Stefan Mescher. Uh, Stefan has over 30 years of experience um, in advanced packaging, failure analysis, and real reliability testing of electronic assemblies at BAA Systems in New York. He has designed and evaluated electronic assemblies for power, 
flight and jet engine control systems used in spacecraft, aircraft, and ground vehicles. Uh, starting in 2004, Stefan began evaluating the commercial legacy materials transition in fact to high reliability, high performance, aerospace and defense electronic systems. He was a member of the 2009 Department of Defense Legacy Electronics Manhattan Project team, and he currently participates in the IC IPC Lead Free Electronics Risk Management Council. Thank you, Stefan, for joining us, and I'll turn it over to you. All right, very good. Thank you, Peter and Rula. Excellent uh, uh, job. Um, move it right along. I think um, you know, Peter covered a lot of the uh, grounds as to how we got here and uh, what um, what's ahead of us. Um, what I've got is a bit of a discussion on tin whispers, um, some new and old failure modes, um, conformal coding uh, to improve mitigation, uh, and some of the detailed examination of our coatings. Um, the, the project team is, is pretty diverse. It, it covers a broad range in addition to myself from BA Systems. Uh, we've got um, people who are expert in assemblies and coding, um, material formulation from Bayer Material Science, uh, conformal coding, manufacturing and formulation from Henkel Electronics, and um, material characterization and Dr. Cho at Binghamton University. So it's a, it's a, it's a strong team and I'm, I'm really proud to be part of that. Um, taking a look at our lead-free electronics, I, I mentioned like new old failure modes. Tin whispers really uh, came about a long time ago. They, were, they first aggravated us in the 40s and 50s with the short circuits and electronics. They actually were cadmium whispers were the first ones that caused us troubles. Uh, shortly thereafter, they, they dug into tin whispers, and it took a lot of research over a lot of years. Um, and then they found out that lead in tin finishes inhibits whiskers. And so that was a great thing, except for now. Um, is no longer the case. Uh, we have many um, um, other materials. We have zinc and cadmium are two other popular materials in electronic systems. Um, cadmium not so much because it has its own toxicity troubles, but zinc uh, we're seeing increased usage for uh, corrosion protection um, on metal frame structures and electronic structures. And you want to be very careful that um, zinc whiskers and uh, floor tiles at uh, computer centers have been very detrimental to electronics. Um, there's environmental effects that uh, Peter alluded to that, uh, that challenge us in terms of fracturing uh, the interconnects, uh, particularly during harsher thermal cycling shock and vibration. And so uh, as we spend some time with tin whiskers, we take a look at um, some of the elect electrical uh, shorting concerns. Uh, they can be developed permanent or intermittent shorts depending upon um, the amount of current available. Um, if you've got a little bit, if you've got enough current, it'll uh, result in intermittent uh, connection because the whisker will fuse. Um, if you don't have so much current, it'll be intermittent. Um, it also showed up in a recent accelerator pedal uh, position sensor. You can look that up on the NASA website. Um, it didn't really cause high acceleration, but it did result in some pretty erratic uh, behavior of the system. And so um, that might, that's a good read. Um, got a lot of good uh, stuff about investigating whiskers and trying to track them down. Um, they also result in debris and contamination. If you've got optical paths or uh, MEMS uh, circuitry, um, you want to pay attention to where you're, uh, where you're dealing with whiskers. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, it, it can result in metal vapor arcing. So if you've got a lot of power, you can, instead of just melting a whisker, you vaporize it. And when you vaporize it, it forms a conductive plasma that can, can conduct many hundreds of amps and result in a little... Uh, uh, it's quite a destructive failure mode, so we want to be watching out for that. And so um, when they look at whiskers and the, the studying of mitigating whiskers, it, it makes sense to understand a little bit about at least the observed factors that have contributed to whisker growth. Um, use and storage, um, where substrate intermetallic uh, grows um, between the substrate and the tin um, is a key factor. The nice thing about that one is that's uh, on the radar screen for cons the industrial uh, controls people and the long-term server people. So 
um, that's good for the DOD because we can pay attention to the studies going on in that realm and benefit from that. Uh, the other place um, is clamping screws and connector contacts. Um, that is also important in uh, consumer electronics, uh, press and connector pins, um, edge mounted uh, brush connectors, and there's a, a fair amount published on that. So the nice thing about that is the DOD didn't have to go figure that out. Where we are different is uh, in terms of uh, corrosion and uh, thermal cycling. Uh, our equipment has a lot more, generally a lot more uh, of that uh, type of uh, uh, stress situation um, as compared to the, uh, the commercial side of things. And uh, the DoD has combinations, you know, it's set around for a long time, see a little bit of thermal cycling, see a little bit of corrosion, and then set around for a while. Um, so it, it's kind of a, mixed, uh, a mixture of all these things that we need to contend with. So when we look to conformal coating as a whisker mitigation, the key thing we're trying to do is to prevent electrical shorts. And we have kind of two basic ways of doing that. One is uh, containing the whiskers, um, keeping them trapped um, on top of the, the metal, um, or if we've got some whispering from an adjacent surface, preventing electrical contact. Um, in this particular project, we're looking at nanoparticles, the ceramic particles, uh, to provide additional isolation and coating improvements. Um, and what we really need in the coating is coverage and strength um, and toughness. Um, some documented issues, uh, you can see up here, ruptured coating for silicone uh, coatings. It was thick, but uh, a nodule grew underneath and ruptured the coating. Um, also, thin coverage. Uh, the coatings have developed over many years uh, uh, for humidity protection. And now many of us are extending uh, the role of those coatings to whisker mitigation. But the rules are different. The original material development is different. Um, so these are some things we're trying to pay attention to. Coverage is key and, and trying to make sure that we don't get um, coating ruptured. Um, of course, coating is a mitigation. If you don't want tin whiskers, you know, don't use pure tin. Um, but that's easier said than done when you start looking at the uh, economics. So the overall technical approach uh, that we pursue on the project is taking a look at two uh, kinds of, of coating base uh, materials. One is a, a traditional solvent-based polyurethane. And the other one is um, um, actually a, a future um, greener, low non-solvent polyurethane acrylate, which is nice because it has an ultraviolet cure uh, and, the, and also a humidity post-cure. Um, and we also want to take a look at layered coating to try to see if the, uh, some combinations of materials would provide improved whisker mitigation and um, being sensitive to uh, rework uh, capabilities. Uh, the DOD is unique in that its materials uh, are used for a very long time. Uh, we've got uh, equipment fielded for 20 years, 30 years is not unusual, um, and they are um, they need rework uh, because system upgrades, you know, you end up with one little chip resistor that's bad, you don't want to be throwing out a whole circuit board. Uh, you may have many obsolete parts that you need to contend with in terms of uh, preventing you from effectively replacing um, a particular piece of equipment. So there's a lot of reasons for us to, uh, to need rework. Um, uh, the starting place we have is a uh, segmented uh, block polymer polyurethane. Um, it, the basic thing is that there's some, some soft segments that provide stretchiness, uh, some hard segments that provide stiffness, and we have added some nanoparticles. Um, the key thing for us is we were looking for a nanoparticle, instead of being a passive filler, to functionalize the surface so that it adheres well uh, to the resin matrix so we can get the, the, the biggest bang for our buck, so to speak, so that the, the particle is an, an active part of the, um, the overall um, system and so that we can add less of it to get um, uh, the uh, desired improvement in, um, in mechanical properties as well as, uh, you know, we have seen some improvements in coverage. And taking a look at the role of functionalization, so we tried uh, two particles, um, a silicon 
a silica-based nanoparticle and a, an alumina-based nanoparticle. And in the silica base, we had uh, some nice uh, distribution of uh, particles through the film. Uh, we can see here that these uh, particles are very nicely distributed. They're generally pretty uniform in size. Um, in the nano alumina, we see our, uh, some big particles and some little particles. And then there's these little uh, clusters that tend to like submicron clusters that, that tend to form with this particular material. We found out a little bit later, we'll look, look at that a little bit more on the next slide, but they were non-functionalized. But all in all, um, you know, regardless of the, of the filler, um, if you look at the size of the filler and the amount of fill we had compared with the whisker diameter, the whisker diameter is about 20 times the scale bar. It's about one micron in diameter. Uh, the scale bar down here is 50 micron, 50 nanometers. So we've got a lot of particles um, available to uh, provide isolation um, if a whisker does start working its way through the polyurethane resin. Uh, these particles are really going to provide good blocking for us. So when we were doing the transmission electron microscopy on the pre previous slide, the precursor to that is a microtome slice. And so that's a basically a it evolved out of the medical industry, but it's a little, it's designed for slicing bones, but it slices uh, these things pretty well. Um, and in the slicing process, one, one side you get a very thin film used for transmission electron microscopy, but the other side you end up with a nice smooth surface on your main mount. And we can examine that using more traditional um, scanning electron microscopy. And what we saw on the nanoaluminum one is we saw gaps uh, between the uh, between the particle and the resin, and uh, that gap is indicative of poor uh, bonding. In the case of the nano silica, the particles were well adhered, and we didn't really see uh, these gaps form. So uh, yeah, you know, live. I, we learned a lot. Um, it uh, you know, so it's an observation. Uh, you know, gaps and poor adhesion are, are undesirable. We tried to further um, define what the criterion might be for a coating with good whisker mitigation effectiveness. And part of that task, in addition to looking at the microstructures, trying to tie those microstructural aspects to the mechanical characteristics. And uh, so one of the things that, uh, that we did was to develop films uh, that we performed tensile testing on. And uh, one of the things we noticed right off is that we had a fair amount of variation from sample to sample. Um, and uh, we saw bubbles uh, in some of the films that um, resulted in um, crack initiation sites, which limited uh, the elongation. You see here, uh, the load is developing and the strain is increasing until we reach a point where the bubble just um, it provides enough strain concentration where the, the, the film basically unzips. So uh, you can see a, a, you know, a few examples of, uh, of different loading, loadings in this coating. But the, the key takeaway is that defects are important when it comes um, to, to um, having your mechanical properties where you want them. And um, so as we go through, we took a look at a number of um, the PC18M was the first uh, material uh, that we evaluated. And we took a look at a number of the different uh, loadings of the nanosilica and the nanoalumina. And we compared it with perylene C. Uh, perylene C is the, you know, it's the Cadillac of coatings. It's a very, very robust coating. It's been in use for a long time in specialized applications. Uh, it's vacuum deposited, which makes it a little pricier. The material itself is pricey. Um, but uh, more importantly, it, because it's vacuum deposited, it has a, a fairly significant masking cost because all the masking needs to be vapor tight, vacuum tight. Um, otherwise, you get inadvertent coverage of your electrical contacts on your connectors, which is bad. Um, it also uh, is difficult. Uh, not really practical to repair with perylene. So most of the repairs on perylene um, revert back to a polyurethane brush coat of some sort. 
Uh, so, you know, that, that's, that's problematic. Uh, but with our 20% uh, nanosilica formulation, you know, we did get comparable properties. You know, it was in the ballpark of the perylene C, so we felt, we felt pretty good about that. Uh, we started taking a look at the low um, uh, VOC polyurethane uh, material, and um, you know, we have some things to, to continue to develop. It, it has lower elongation characteristics, um, and, uh, but it does have some real benefits in terms of rapid curing, uh, low energy consumption, um, and uh, environmentally friendly processing. So it, it's something that we need to spend some more time on. Um, and even these properties, might, we might find them to be sufficient from a whisker mitigation perspective. Um, so anyway, further study there. We'd like to see some better elongation characteristics. Uh, the drawn films tended to have a, a high frequency of defects, and we're trying to sort that out right now. Uh, we also looked at the four-point adhesion testing. Um, in the four-point adhesion, that's, that's critical in modeling when we start looking at the um, penetration resistance um, that we have, um, uh, that we expect to get from a particular coating. Understanding what that adhesion is is a key input to the, to the modeling, um, so we're capturing that on the materials uh, as well. We take a look at what a coating needs to live through in a, in a traditional uh, DOD assembly. And one of the first, first things we saw, this is from our um, uh, 1753 project, uh, we saw a lot of deformation of our solder joints. So this first uh, set here um, was alloy 42 uh, uncoated um, in a thermal shock cycle. That thermal shock cycle is the um, industry standard for piece part testing. It's a three cycle per hour, very rapid thermal transients, but it really made a lot of damage on the, on the solder trains. And it also led to um, suboptimal whisker growth. We ended up with a lot more, a lot of deformation mechanisms that didn't have anything to do with whiskers. They, they would stress a coating a lot, so we're paying attention to that. Um, and the other thing we, we saw is that um, we, we examined uh, combinations of, of cycles, so thermal cycles followed by high humidity on um, copper leads, you know, resulted in some very interesting tin extrusions occurring at grain boundaries. The bottom line is that the DOD um, coatings need to survive these some of these sorts of stresses, um, remain intact and uh, remain adhered to provide both humidity and uh, and whisker mitigation protection. So what else did we see? How else does the coating get stressed by the solder or the coating? Um, we have seen, um, there's lots of pictures of whiskers, uh, but we also saw odd-shaped eruptions, these large structures. We saw them a couple of places. Large structures that form, uh, they're called nodules or odd eruptions uh, in the literature, and we saw some of that as well. So one of the things that coating needs to survive is uh, tin nodule growth under there. Uh, we also saw some step, um, tin steps formed during thermal cycles and some cracks, and so the coating needs to stretch around those features as they form on an assembly. And uh, the interaction between the coating and the whisker, um, you know, is is complex. We get um, tin growth, you know, growing up underneath the coating. As the coating stretches, it becomes stronger. We saw some of that. It's strain hardening as the, uh, as the polymer segments align. Um, also, uh, the tin um, creeps and yields um, underneath the coating. So it has, um, you know, pretty poor keep creep resistance, which is good for us, but it's, you know, it's a metal. It's not a polymer. Um, if the whisker gets long enough, uh, we can take advantage of buckling, because once the buckling load is achieved, uh, the whisker collapses pretty readily. 
So those are some of the things we're looking at to try to understand this interaction between coding, its strength, its modulus, its elongation, its adhesion, and trying to find an optimal combination of those that give us favorable whisker protection. So some initial results um, of the coding. We uh, did uh, 2,500 hours of 60-degree uh, C, 60% relative humidity. Uh, bright tin is a, is a good whisker grower over copper. We did a little bit of bending preload. And uh, interim, interesting results. So that's like three and a half months of testing. These are long, long tests uh, to run. Um, one interesting thing is that the coating itself had, in areas where it was thick, had very little whisker nodule growth, very little. And where it started getting a little thinner as it started tapering off in the edge, this is the uncoated area, and here's the coated area. Um, the uncoated area grew whiskers right next to the coating. Where the coating was like three microns thick, we had an eruption that broke through. Where it was a little thicker, we had 30 microns, we saw the nodes will grow underneath the coating, but it did not yet penetrate. So uh, I think that's very encouraging. So. Um, you know, we're seeing an actual inhibition of whisker growth uh, by uh, this particular coating, which is uh, our PC18 with the nanosilica. And uh, of course, the proof of the pudding comes when you look at a, an assembly. Flat coupons are pretty easy to coat uniformly, but in an assembly, you've got vertical leads, you've got horizontal features, you've got corners, you've got edges. This is the unfilled version of the coating, and after some coating and some thermal cycles, uh, we saw some crack formation where the coating was thin. The cracks propagate along the side here and on down. Um, with the nanosilica, we didn't see any crack uh, formation over the same environments. Um, as coated, it had a little bit of thinning on some of the corners, but far less than what we saw with the unfilled coating. And the nanoalumina, um, looked like it coated the best. So wouldn't you have it that the non-functional um, material yielded the best coating coverage, even though it may not have optimal mechanical properties, but it had excellent coverage uh, during the spray coat. Uh, and of course, our Paraline C for reference, you can see, you know, it coated everything. There was, you know, no thickness buildup. There was no uh, unfilled regions. Um, so that was, you know. As usual, that's excellent performance that the, uh, the Paraline gave us. Um, to help support the modeling, um, there was a need to quantify the uh, coating coverage. And so we utilized the quad flatback. Uh, this one happened to be a 44 pin. Uh, we also included a thinner one, a 64 pin, and a, a plastic lead, a chip carrier, different lead configurations. But we settled on the QFP44. Um, to do our thickness characterization cross-section down the middle of the lead. And the reason cross-sectioning was necessary was that we needed to quantify actually the coating thickness. So along the top of the knee, it was thinner than on the back in this particular case. That's interesting because the, the coating wrapped around this particular lead and coated behind there. So that was very encouraging. With the, the nanosilica, we had better coverage on top and behind, so that was good. And on the nanoalumina, uh, we had excellent coverage on the front and maybe got a little bit thinner behind. And of course, the paraline is that was, you know, just 30 microns front and back. It was just 30 microns, um, which is a you know typical target thickness. And usually that goes between uh, a little under 20 microns to about uh, 25 microns for typical assemblies. So here's our situation. Um, we've got a fleet of these vehicles. These vehicles are getting called up to duty. And we don't want any surprises. So we don't want any unintended introductions of tin where we didn't plan on it. And there's a lot of pieces of electronics um, on a vehicle, and there's you know a lot on an aircraft. There's a lot of electronics on all of our uh, defense systems. Um, so, but you know it's not a the system design just needs to be aware of where systems are using tin, what the failure mode effects are, and if there's mitigations in place. Um, 
there are definite cost advantages for leveraging a low cost display. Um, you might pay say three hundred bucks for this display commercially and you know several thousand dollars for you know a custom tin lead version that doesn't have any you know tin in it. So you may choose to do a strategic replacement of that display, thinking about when you'd want to do a technology refresh anyway. So there's you know different different pieces um, have different uh, requirements. It's hard to tell. The important thing is it's a it's a systems it's a systems approach to that. Um, so to kind of recap on the DoD side of things, you know, we've got. DOD has significant environmental stresses. Uh, we've got multiple mission critical systems on board, um, and you want to be very careful of single point failure. Um, product life is long. Uh, we've got design life certainly at the 25 year point, with actual usage well beyond that. I think I heard somebody from the Navy, they were still using teletypes. Still using teletypes. Probably no cyber people are going to be able to crack into that thing. Um, and the system must survive repairs. Uh, the user has to survive the failure events, and the equipment needs to be able to be repairable. So, in conclusion, you know we've got some very promising results with the PC18M uh, nanoparticles with nanosilica in particular. Um, we've got pretty good properties in comparison with Paralene C. Um, we've got some good coverage. Uh, characteristics. We do have some issues with mechanical properties and defects. I uh, need to pay attention to those. Um, and uh, definitely have whisker mitigation when it gets thick enough. And uh, so getting it thick enough is, is, is continues to be important. Uh, the low VOC, uh, we, we have some indication local properties are comparable to PCHNM with nano indentation, uh, but coverage of macro properties still need some work there. And uh, from the DoD benefit side of things, you know, mature, military leverages significant cost benefits uh, from using commercial off-the-shelf lead-free electronics. Um, unfortunately, our uh, additional care we need to take in selecting them and implementing them uh, has increased. We've got combinations of environments that promote whisker growth, uh, unlike consumer electronics, and they're very, very difficult to troubleshoot. They're almost impossible to see optically unless there's a huge number of them. And they behave a little bit like gremlins in the system. You know, they're short, you put no meter on them, you might pop it if you're not aware that they're there. And uh, all of a sudden the thing clears and you say, oh, I thought it wasn't working. And all of a sudden it's working. The key takeaway is you know, mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. Um, coatings um, provide um, considerably better mitigation than no coating at all. Any coating, even if it is an enhanced coating, is a huge step above um, non-mitigation. Programs continue to need education. Uh, there is a standard written, an SAE, GIA standard. 5-2 uh, standards for mitigating it. I recommend reading it and implementing it on uh, any uh, cust any uh, hardware your customer uh, requested on. Um, at this point, I think we're open for questions. Um, so, are there any any further questions we want to address? Yes, yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Stefan. We got a lot of questions for you. And for starters, just uh, again to reinforce the issue of uh, of whiskers, um, one of the questions states: Do whiskers really exist in the military, and do they cause uh, extreme problems? Well, they can't tell you. Um, so they 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 do. Um, the question is whether the systems are robust and tolerant. To Against the failure mode and effects, or whether the, the failures that um, result are um, tolerable, maybe just impacting availability, but not necessarily safety. I think the safety systems are in pretty good shape, uh, but there are a number of systems that don't utilize any conformal coatings, and I think those are probably at our higher risk uh, category. All right, thank you. Um, why not just call a uh, quote with uh, Paralene? 
Uh, you have um, cost, uh, repairability, um, are probably the two biggest issues. Um, certainly it can be done, uh, but there are significant advantages to a spray coated uh, system and of the spray coatings, the polyurethane uh, family uh, performs the best uh, from current whisker testing. So you leverage ease of application, ease of masking, ease of repairability. Um, I think those are all strong uh, reasons to utilize uh, a spray coat uh, rather than a, a vacuum deposit coat if you can. Okay, thank you. Uh, does the carrier material in the coating shrink during cure? And if so, what about edge recession of the coating leaving discontinuities uh, uncoated? Yeah, there, there, there is uh, certainly some shrinkage uh, during the cross-linking phase um, of the cure. Uh, it it's, happens with all coatings. Uh, the trick is to make sure that that residual stress isn't so high that it results in tearing or pull away from those corners. All right. Thank you. Uh, can you please explain why no whisker growth was found under nanoparticle-filled PUs? It seems expected that the growth would still be occurring, but the coating would do a better job of holding it captive. Yeah. You know, we've been uh, spending a fair amount of time on that discussion. You know, whisker growth is a phenomenon that occurs on a free surface of tin. And with the coating, it's not really a free surface of tin anymore. So we're thinking that that is impacting the whisker nucleation kinetics. Uh, but we're not exactly certain exactly how. But that's a, that's an excellent question. Thank you, Stefan. Um, is there an easy way to verify coverage? Um, the scanning electron microscope image um, that we showed where the bright region showed thin uh, coverage it's probably the easiest to reckon to determine whether or not there's three microns of coating. Um, thicker than that, cross-sectioning really needs to be done. I think that a running a coupon um, periodically in the coating process, a little bit more than just a flat coupon, might be beneficial, or some combination of flat couponing with sectioning of a more complicated coupon that actually has representative parts on it, I think might be a good way to get there. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, there's a comment slash question for you. Um, you said that controlling tin whiskers mitigate, mitigate, mitigate. Um, that is very well said. Um, the author of the question said that they use IEC slash TS. 62647-2 to do this. And the yes. question is, do you have any particular preference for SAE slash GEIA slash STD0052 or will either one do? Yeah, those are actually a parallel uh, specifications. The um, When we worked with the IPC and prior to that it was GEIA, um, in developing those standards, we felt it would be important to have a, um, a European um, recognized standard, and those those two standards are, are parallel. They they have the very similar language uh, between them, and the person that's in charge of the the one on the SAA standard is also uh, directly talking to the person responsible uh, for the IEC version. Great. Thank you so much, Stefan. I have questions for both you and Peter, so if you could please both offer an opinion on why you think there is no DOD policy on using lead-free electronics. Peter, would you like to start? Well, I, I don't want to really try to outguess uh, DOD specifically, but uh, there, I think there is a lack of understanding and 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 uh, quantitative understanding uh, and, uh, and a, a fear of, of surprises and so on that probably made a hesitation, but 
I think Steph's the ones who should be addressing this. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I think there's a lot of applications within the DOD that can benefit from lead-free electronics provided the system um, effects are well understood and you can leverage the low cost. Um, I think that the DOD, again, there's a lot of press, especially since 2006, saying, you know, lead-free is more reliable than tin lead. Look at all the test data. And they published the mean um, cycling resistance rather than the first failure. Well, you know, I, I ran testing back in 1986 on SM96 um, silver solder, and it had a higher mean failure rate than my tin lead do, but its first failure was quite a bit less than my tin lead system. So it was kind of a little bit of a, an agenda. There's a lot of agendas out there. Um, I think that the recipes are being defined, but inherently the lead-free systems I think just aren't well understood, and I, and I don't think solder and electronics are that well understood in a lot of parts of the DOD. Um, they're just using them because they're just computers and they execute code. Um, so I think it's just a, a, you know, an understanding um, issue, an education issue. Thank you both. And in closing, another question that we'd like uh, your opinion on. Uh, do you expect that all DOD applications can be transitioned to lead-free if we do enough research? Peter? I would, if, yes. If we do enough research, uh, I would think you're going to find that there are applications where you would not prefer it, but you could. Uh, I think, I think uh, my expectation is that lead-free can be more reliable than tin lead. The, the weakness is we don't know, or people in general don't, uh, don't know yet in which cases. And I think even when it's going to be less uh, reliable, uh, you'll know by how much. So I, would, I, I don't see any reason it couldn't be transferred there, but uh, you'd, you'd have to remove the uncertain, more than anything, the uncertainties. Yeah, I think the, the key there is to have a, um, you know, a programmatic approach to, you know, where the material gets introduced and understand uh, the risk associated with potential early failures. And environments that are closer to commercial consumer electronics are going to be um, uh, quicker to adopt, and those that deviate are more harsh and more restrictive are going to be um, you know, less quick to um, uh, to transition. I, I fully expect that there's going to be some systems like space that will continue to be tin lead and uh, non-tin finishes for a long, long time. Um, and, but they will pay accordingly um, to do that, mostly because they don't have a repairability option uh, for many of those systems. Uh, if you have repair options, then that's a matter of scheduling a replacement and accepting that maybe the life is or isn't 20 years or it's only 15 years and maybe the packaging density uh, needs a decrease to put some more vibration isolation or something else like that to reduce stresses in the high stress environments. Um, you know, did some chip resistor thermal cycling and it didn't do that well um, compared to tin lead. And it wasn't that harsh a, a condition and across the board they didn't perform as well as the tin lead. So, you know, I didn't have much acceleration factor on top of it. Um, so there's, there's, it's comfort level. It's getting experience, uh, getting some field experience, and working through the, um, uh, the logistics is going to be important. Peter and Steph, I would like to thank you both on behalf of Startup and ESCCP, and I'd also like to thank our audience for attending today's webinar. As a reminder, the presentation and audio will be archived for future reference on the Sort of Fun ESCCP webpage. And also, if you'd like copies of the slides, there are slides that are currently available in PDF format on um, Sort of Fun ESCCP's uh, webpage. I'd like to remind you all that the next webinar is on Thursday, March 19th. It will focus on the quantify on, on quantifying. Um, and managing, uh, managing tools for the selection of bioremediation approaches at coronary deposit sites. This webinar will feature two speakers, Dr. John Wilson and Ms. Carmen LeBron. 
Uh, and with that, I would like uh, all of you to please uh, consider taking a moment survey uh, that will pop up on your screen when the webinar ends. Thank you.